today uh, from a lot of different directions. What I've been trying to do <clears throat> in recent years, among other things, is to provide people who have a serious interest, like you, with the ammunition to deal with the nasty, noisy negativists, as I call them. And I will start my lecture so you'll know where I stand. Not a, I'm sure you do, but still. Four major conclusions after 51 years of study, only 42 years of shooting my mouth up. First, the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. That means some, underlined 33 times, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not, I don't care about them. Second, and I think this audience is old enough to understand the term, we're dealing with a cosmic water gate, meaning some few people within major governments have known since at least July 1947, when at least two flying saucers were recovered, crashed, bodies near in New Mexico, near Roswell, if you will. Uh, that doesn't mean everybody in the government knows what's going on. That's not how security works. The third conclusion is that there are no good arguments to be made against the first two conclusions. Uh, oh, there are noisy negativists out there who do charismatic hand-waving to try to say it's all baloney. Uh, none of their arguments stand up under careful scrutiny. Normally, they're not exposed to careful scrutiny. That's my role, I guess. And four, because I'm obviously a shy, retiring kind of guy, we're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, bodies and wreckage, for 62 years. And I use the term millennium intentionally, not two millennia, because then I get into arguments about religion, and I don't want to get into arguments about religion. Okay, now, key word there was evidence. Some people object to the notion of having flying saucers and science in the same sentence. It's all baloney, they say. There's no science there. There is science there. Science is a method of problem solving. How do you find out what the truth is? You hypothesize, you gather evidence, you evaluate the evidence, you test your conclusions, you test them again. It isn't the art of proclamation. So I'll put my four objections, of the four problems that I have with the noisy negativists. Their four basic rules are totally incompatible with science. But the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. If you can't attack the data, attack the people. It's a lot easier and nobody will know the difference anyway. And finally, do your research by proclamation. Investigation is too much trouble and again, nobody will know the difference anyway. These are, you can see a good example of that in the current issue of Skeptical Inquirer. Cover story, scientific evaluation of the UFO subject. Boy, will you find baloney there. I, I don't own a baloney company, incidentally. <laughs> it's a convenient word to use. Well, okay, I want to do a number of different things. One is to review the large-scale scientific studies. It's sort of following the pattern of my book. But the problem is, I find that the noisy negativists never talk about those studies. So. Those of you who have a serious interest should at least be made aware of them so that you can deal with the objections raised by those bad guys out there. Okay. I don't have to say next slide anymore. I can do it myself. There's the cover of the book. Came out last year. It's in its third printing. Uh, I'm almost out of them here. My other books will be available at my table in the vendor's hall. But you can get them by mail. There's an order blank there. You can get them from Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, all those places. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> OK. Here's the biggest study ever done. 
It was done for the United States Air Force, not for a UFO group. The work was done by Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. It was completed way back in 1955. It wasn't distributed. A press release was distributed, as you might expect. And you'll see how accurate the press release was in just a minute. The beginning part of it dealt with, soon we will be building things that look like these so-called saucers. Don't worry about it, they're ours. There's really nothing to this. Now, you'll see that that's more baloney. Here's what the Secretary of the Air Force said in the press release. Got wide coverage across the country, 25 October 1955. On the basis of this study, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. I feel certain that even the unknown 3% could have been explained as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been obtained. Well, that pretty much takes care of it, doesn't it? There's nothing to this. We looked and we didn't find, except for the, when there wasn't enough data. Now, it's interesting that the press release didn't give the title of the report. Surely some reporter would have said, what do you mean special report 14? What happened to 1 through 13? The truth was they were still classified, incidentally. They didn't say where the work was done, but tell Memorial Institute so nobody could call them. They didn't give the authors of the report. It was sort of selective in their choice of data. And boy, is that the understatement. Remember, unknown 3%. Here's the data from the report. Uh, there's a word psychological on there. In other words, it was really uh, psychological problems, basically. One and a half percent of the cut is reports were from crazy people, if you want to simplify things. That's one and a half percent, not 15, not 80. It's the last category down there that we're interested in. What did the Secretary of Air Force say? Even the unknown 3%? Gee, his math wasn't very good, was it? You notice it's 21.5%. I mean, if he said 3 and it was really 3.5, I'd forgiven that. But from 3 to 21.5 does not compute. It's the Secretary of the Air Force, mind you. Uh, you won't mind if I say he lied? Uh, on my website, www.stantonfreeman, I have a whole long article about government UFO lies. And boy, are they lots of them. Now, notice the next to the last category up there. Insufficient information. They define all these terms. And it's perfectly clear, if there wasn't enough evidence available about a sighting, it could not be listed as an unknown. And what did he say? Even the unknowns could have been explained if more complete observational data had been available. Another lie, 9.3%. Now, the guys who did this study, there were 3,201 reports, as you can see. They did a quality evaluation. Well, if you were believing the Air Force, you'd expect, well, of course, most sightings were poor quality. Those are the only ones we couldn't identify, right? No, not right. Four quality groupings from the top down, 35% of the excellent sightings could not be identified. Only 18% of the poor sightings. Look over to the right, the insufficient information cases. Not surprising, the better the quality, the less likely to be listed as insufficient information. The better the quality, the more likely to be listed as unknown. How many times have you heard debunkers say that they're only poor quality cases, or there isn't enough data, or whatever? Now, the guys who did this study asked another question, one that's probably occurred to most of you. They said, is there really any difference between the unknowns and the knowns? Maybe we missed the boat in this screening process. So they looked at six different observable characteristics, apparent size, color, shape, speed, that sort of thing. They did a chi-square analysis. Don't worry if you don't know what that means. 
what they found, you'll understand. The probability that the unknowns were just misknowns was less than 1%. Less than 1%. The unknowns are not simply misknowns. They don't match in any of the six categories which were checked. And a very important one, maneuverability, wasn't even included. So it's an extraordinarily important study done for the Air Force, never publicly distributed, it wasn't classified, and lied about persistently, and not mentioned in the anti-UFO literature. Thirteen anti-UFO books, not one mentions Blue Book, Special Report 14, although I can guarantee you that all of the authors, some did more than one, knew about it. What the public doesn't know, I'm not going to tell them. Here are two more sources. On the left, the UFO evidence. My left? That's your left, too. Okay. Uh, it's just a collection of 4,500 cases looked at by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. 18% could not be identified. There were sightings by pilots, by military pilots, sightings by law enforcement officers, sightings by engineers and scientists, sightings by astronomers. An astounding collection of reports, conspicuous by its absence in the discussions by the noisy negativist. The one on the right, Symposium on Unidentified Flying Objects, hearings before the Committee on Science and Astronautics, held on my birthday, incidentally, July 29th. Uh, not the day I was born, the date I was born, <laughs> uh, 1968. Testimony from 12 scientists. I was the only one without a PhD, incidentally. I'm very proud of that. Who needs a piled higher and deeper degree? Come on. Uh, covering a broad spectrum of professional backgrounds, uh, astronomer, astrophysicist, psychologist, uh, civil engineer, uh, nuclear physicist, uh, quite a wide variety from respectable institutions like uh, Harvard and Northwestern and Stanford and University of California, Berkeley, Westinghouse, General Dynamics, etc. Uh, the best paper by far was one by the late Dr. James E. McDonald, a professor of physics over at the University of Arizona. Jim had talked to 500 witnesses. He presented testimony, his investigation, on 41 separate cases. And anybody who thinks there aren't any good sightings should read Jim's paper. I've offered it separately because government can't copyright stuff, so it's on the free list that's out at my table. But he had multiple witness cases, sightings over big cities, multiple witness radar visual cases, uh, sightings, uh, every category you can think of, including by astronomers, incidentally, and by pilots. And there are still people saying that astronomers never see UFOs. Phil Plate, who publishes, a, he's got a website, Bad Astronomy. And boy, he typifies it with his comments about UFOs. If they were really coming here, astronomers would see lots of them. They do, but he says they don't see any. Nobody would tell him, I'm sure, because fear of ridicule is a big problem. And once Phil goes after you, you may have a problem. But excellent source of data. Published by the United States government, mind you. I'd ask how many had read these things, but I can't see enough to get an answer. There's the University of Colorado study. You've all heard about it. Surprising as it may seem to you, it turns out that 30% of the 117 cases studied in detail could not be identified according to a special UFO subcommittee of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the AIAA. And in case you're wondering, was that a bunch of UFO buffs? I volunteered to be on the committee. They wouldn't have me. I'd expressed an opinion. After 11 years of study, you'd think I would have. But uh, So it was not done by UFO buffs. I love the words that are always tossed in. You know, 
uh, 30% could not be identified. You wouldn't know that from the press release that was sent out, though, or from the press coverage. Uh, Long Beach, California paper said, now the UFO nuts can join that other crazy group, the Flat Earth Society, and let the rest of us do something useful. Pity they didn't point out that 30% of the cases couldn't be explained. Strange world we have. Uh, somebody should do a PhD thesis on the world of misinformation about flying saucers. It would take them a long time to complete it because there's so much of it out there. Dr. J. Allen Hynek was the Air Force scientific consultant on UFOs for 20, almost 21 years. After he was finished consulting when they closed Project Blue Book in 1969, he wrote a book, The UFO Experience, got data on more than 70 cases that couldn't be explained. It's funny, the astronomers that speak out against UFOs never refer to Allen's book. One wonders why. He was a good man. He was a conservative man. He started the Center for UFO Studies, got a lot of people interested in the subject. He came in with the comet in 1910, left with the comet, Haley's Comet in 1986. That's appropriate for an astronomer. He had a good sense of humor. You may have heard about swamp gas in Michigan in the mid-60s. And boy, did the, the cartoonists go to, <laughs> go to work on that one. And Alan collected. He had dozens and dozens of these cartoons talking about swamp gas. Uh, we don't have too many like him anymore. Okay. Now, I'll let you wonder about what this is for just a minute. There are four major reasons why the big shots of science and journalism haven't jumped on the UFO bandwagon, which they obviously have not. First is ignorance. I normally check my audiences when I can see, and I find that fewer than 2% have read any of the major large-scale scientific studies. And I've talked to as many as 2,000 people at once. So ignorance is understandable. You'd think they wouldn't express an opinion then, though, wouldn't you? But, you know. The second is fear of ridicule. Nobody wants to be laughed at. We don't want any connection. I've got, had professors say, well, don't tell anybody I'm interested in this subject, you know. And it's the students who come to my lectures, not the professors. I did have one, in the question and answer period, he started, he stood up first. I've never heard so much nonsense in one night in my life, he said. Great way to start the question and answer period. I'm, I couldn't have told you what I would say, but what I did say was, can you be more specific, please? And he proceeded with about six different you said that's. The first one set the tone. You said that Betty and Barney Hill were taken to Zeta Reticuli and back in two hours. I didn't say that. What I said was they were taken on board a flying saucer for two hours. They didn't go anywhere. And they were put back out. And there were about five more of these. And finally somebody in the audience said, how about taking some sensible questions? This guy walks out. So I said, I'll take your question, but who was that? Obviously, I had gotten under his skin. He was a professor of physics. Who else? I mean, who obviously hadn't heard what I had said. It was his dream notions of what a UFO nut might say, I suppose. Okay. The third problem is ego. There were people who said, if aliens were coming here, they'd want to talk to me. I talked to a journalist who said, they'd have called a press conference and I would have been invited. <laughs> there was a Harvard professor who said, if aliens were coming here, they'd wish to talk to the National Academy of Sciences, of which he was a member. And the whole attitude was, they haven't asked for an appointment, they must not be coming here. Well. There's a real ego problem here. You see, flying saucers finished the job that Copernicus started. You all remember old Nick Copernicus back in 1540-something or other. He wrote a book which wasn't allowed to be published for 300 years. 
in which he had the gall to suggest that the earth was not the center of the universe. Can you imagine? He moved it over one step. The sun's the middle of the universe. Oh no, said the church. The book was banned for 300 years. We have new guys in white coats now, not priesthood. They're scientists who insist that if aliens were coming here, they'd want to talk to them or share their views. Uh, that's a pretty big stretch. What are, we gonna, what are they going to learn from us? How to make a mess out of a planet? We're experts at that. I wonder how many of you recall that in World War II, we only killed 50 million of our own kind. We destroyed 1,700 cities. That's not a very good recommendation for what an advanced civilization we have, is it? Okay, the fourth problem, right up my alley, finally. You can't get here from there. It's too far. It would take too long. It would take too much energy. And the astronomers say there's probably life all over the place out there, but you can't get here from there. Give us a few bucks and we'll build a radio telescope and listen for signals. Because undoubtedly they're trying to attract our attention. And undoubtedly we are so smart that we can figure out the system they're using for the communication. And so let's carry the ball. Let us carry the ball. These are the SETI cultists, as I call them. I'll be talking about them as we go along. You know, SETI, S-E-T-I, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence? Nah. Silly effort to investigate. That's what it means. <laughs> but how about this notion of you can't get here from there? Oh, you can find loads of statements by people who don't know anything about travel out there uh, so proving that it's impossible. I'm working on a new book. It's impossible, isn't it? in which I cover a lot of subjects in which prominent, smart people have said stupid things about impossibility. One of them is you can't get here from there. As a matter of fact, the head of the Hayden Planetarium in New York on the Peter Jennings mockumentary of, of what, four years ago now, uh, said our fastest craft, the Voyager spacecraft, that takes 70,000 years to get to the nearest star, and scientists like to be around when their experiments are finished, so nonsense, in other words. He didn't bother to mention that, oh, it doesn't have a propulsion system on it and it's coasting. You know, you throw a bottle in the ocean, that tells you how long it takes to cross the ocean, fly a kite, and that takes you how long it takes, tells you how long it takes to get around. Well, can you get here from there? Well, where's there? I'll be talking about the Betty and Barney Hill case and the fact that the base stars there, are two stars, not in another galaxy. Andromeda's two million light years away. It's kind of a ways not across our own galaxy, maybe 100,000 light years across, down the street, 39 light years away. That's an easier chore. It's easier to get here if you live in Las Vegas than if you live in Sydney, Australia. So we gotta focus. Okay, how are you gonna do it? We have had a program for the use of nuclear energy for propulsion for more than 50 years. Here's an early example, about 1955. Uh, what you see here is a monstrous apparatus with two jet engines at the bottom. There's a nuclear reactor buried inside the middle of this thing. And we actually operated the jet engines on nuclear power, part of the aircraft nuclear propulsion program at General Electric. And I had somebody write an article on Wikipedia saying Friedman only worked on paper studies. Well, I worked on this program. In 1958, we spent $100 million. That was a lot of money in 1958. I mean, maybe it isn't now, but uh, you know, banks lose that much every day. But uh, it was a lot of money then. 3,500 people full time, 1,100 of them engineers and scientists. Oh, the program was canceled like everything else I worked on, but we were working on it. And a much more sophisticated version is this one. Two jet engines, reactor in the middle. Uh, it never did fly. If we wanted to spend the money, we could have flown it. It was neat, it was exciting. Program was canceled. Same thing happened to this. This is a nuclear-powered ramjet. 
What would it be used for? I mean, that would be used for bombers to drop bombs any place in the world. Unlimited range for a nuclear-powered airplane. You replace the crew, but you don't replace the fuel. You can fly thousands of hours without refueling. This is a nuclear ramjet. Its job would be to drop nuclear weapons any place in the world. You'd carry it aloft, drop it off, light it up, and there it goes. Bomb, bomb, bomb. The program was canceled. Here are several different versions of nuclear rocket engines. LASL is Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory. The comparative size, you see the guy in the middle there. Uh, you'll notice the, they list the amount of power. Now you say, ah, oh, come on, Stan, those are just sketches, artist concepts. Well, we built them. It's a little closer. Liquid hydrogen comes in very cold, goes out very hot. That's the simplest way to explain it. Uh, the temperature on the hot side is about 4,000 degrees. And if you use this on an upper stage on a rocket, you can double the payload to Mars. If you wanted to go to Mars. Not next week, anyway. Here's one that worked. I worked on this one. This is for Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Lab. There's a reactor in the middle there. Power level of this thing, which is about this big, was 1,100 megawatts. What does that mean? Well, power level of Grand Coulee Dam is 2,000 megawatts. Half the power of Grand Coulee Dam was this big. And it worked. It was exciting, I'll tell you. I had some experiments on that. Uh, this was done here in Nevada, out at the nuclear test site near Jackass Flats. Don't blame me for that name. <laughs> this was only 1,100 megawatts. Uh, this one was 4,400 megawatts. This big. Twice the power of Grand Coulee Dam. This was tested before 1970. Most people have never heard of it. And the program was canceled because we don't have a use for it. We haven't decided to go anywhere. We're thinking about the possibility of perhaps considering reviewing the possibility of going to Mars or setting up a base on the moon. That's not leadership, in my opinion. There's one in operation. Area 51 is just the other side. And you don't want to be close to these things when they're running. And a lot of radiation coming out. Now, don't let the equation scare you. These are all nuclear fission systems. I'm much more excited about nuclear fusion. And if you're wondering why you should care about nuclear fusion, you better care because that's what's going on in the sun. It's the most important source of energy in all of our lives, nuclear fusion. And in the early 1960s, I worked at Aerojet General Nucleonics, and we looked at fusion reactions for deep space propulsion. Now, what's the big deal about fission and fusion? E equals mc squared. C is a very big number, the speed of light. So the energy that you can get from a little mass, if you're clever and know how to use it, is enormous. The top row here, that's helium-3, an isotope of helium, and D stands for deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen. If you can get them to react, and they don't like each other because they're both positively charged, so they stay away from each other. But if you can get them to react, maybe blow off a fission bomb, and that gets everything moving very fast, and you can get them to react. If you're smart, you get 18.3 million electron volts, which doesn't mean anything to anybody except your normal chemical reactions, you know, gasoline burning in your car and whatever. That's a few electron volts, less than 20 electron volts. Here you can get almost 20 million electron volts of energy. 10 million times as much energy per particle as you can get in a dumb old chemical rocket. 10 million times. Equally exciting is the fact that every advanced civilization is going to know about nuclear fusion because they're going to figure out how their star produces its energy. We managed that. 1938, we figured out, oh, that's not burning gas up there. That's nuclear fusion. Now, we proceeded to do something useful with it. In 1952, we exploded the world's first H-bomb. That's a fusion bomb. Uh, it only produced as much energy as exploding 10 million tons of TNT. 
10 million tons of TNT. The fireball was three miles wide. This was out in the Pacific. We took away half an island. Can you imagine what the aliens must have thought about that? What are these idiots up to here? So we know about fusion. Are there other techniques? Of course there will be. But these are things we know about here and now, if you want to spend the money. That's a different question. So the notion that you can't get here from there is baloney. Now you notice I'm not talking about to going to intergalactic, to other galaxies. I'm talking about going down the street, around the corner, in the neighborhood. I didn't drive here from Fredericton, New Brunswick. I didn't have time to do that. I caught a couple of airplanes. So if you go in a local neighborhood, it's different from going a long distance away, and I don't worry about that. Okay, here's the question, isn't it? Never mind the saucer. Did you see the guys who were driving? Does a nuclear physicist believe in little green men? Well, they are small. They're not green. They, you know, yeah, I believe aliens have walked around on the planet Earth. Oh, not once or twice. Uh, the Mutual UFO Network Humanoid Study Group has thousands of reports of aliens. There's a guy in Missouri, Ted Phillips, who's collected more than 4,000 physical trace cases from 90 countries where the saucer is seen on or near the ground, and after it leaves, one finds physical changes. One-sixth of those cases involve reports of beings, little guys, call them what you want. The top researchers have collectively looked at about a thousand abduction cases involving aliens, the guys who were driving. I don't know who gave them a license, you understand, but uh, here's a typical physical trace. This is in Delphos, Kansas, that ring there. I hope it shows up. Yes, it does, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a long story. Suffice to say, a young man saw the thing sitting on the ground there, Ronnie Johnson. It took off. He dashed into the house, told his parents he'd just seen his flying, a flying saucer. They laughed. He got angry. You don't need to believe me. You go out and see it. It was moving slowly. They went out and they did see it. They go back here. Mother puts her hand down on this glowing ring of soil. Her fingers go numb. That's a little scary. They called the sheriff's office the next day. He came out and checked for radioactivity, didn't find any. She couldn't take pulses at the nursing home where she worked part-time for quite some time. Uh, Ted Phillips, this guy I was just mentioning, heard about the case. There's an article in the local paper, Delphos Republican. And he went out and talked to the family, got samples of the soil. Down 14 inches, the ring there, the soil was dry. Control samples from nearby, perfectly normal dirt. I think I have, yeah. Ring soil on the left, uh, ring soil on the right, normal soil on the left. Obviously different in color and texture. I had good lab tests done. The ring soil has a much higher level of soluble minerals. It's too salty to grow anything, and for years it wouldn't grow anything. Ted's collected 4,000 cases like this. And people will tell you, there is no physical evidence. They want me to bring an alien with me, you know. Or hold up a piece of, this is part of a flying saucer. What do you suppose that'd be worth on the open market? Boy. Uh, so there are a lot of such cases. And incidentally, if you, and I couldn't find the slide when I needed it, the ring soil won't absorb moisture. The normal soil from a few feet away does well. Now, please don't complain about the paper plate. That's a sophisticated soil retention device. <laughs> well, I had one guy get mad at me. He couldn't believe anything I said because of that darn paper plate. Well, when I was at the University of Chicago, there was a Nobel Prize winning physics experiment in which a key piece of equipment was held up by an empty coffee can. If they could use a coffee can, I can use a sophisticated soil retention device. <laughs> Famous, none of those cases, you know, do we have abductions or stuff to worry about. This is Betty and Barney Hill. They're both gone now. Uh, I met them both. Barney died in 69. I met Betty many times, and I've 
finished a book, which I'm sold out here, but have more at home with Betty's niece and myself, has all the tapes. You've probably all heard this story. They're driving along in New Hampshire. They see a UFO. They keep going. They sort of goes along with them. They stop. Barney uses binoculars. Here's this round thing, maybe 60 or 80 feet in diameter. Double row of windows, strange beings inside. Scares the heck out of them. They drive off, and then things get murky. They hear some strange sounds, and another set of strange sounds, and they go on home, getting home two hours later than they should have in New Hampshire. And uh, disturbed. There were strange things. Betty's dress was torn. Barney's shoes were scuffed. He was a very good dresser. Inexplicable things. And two hours missing. Well, again, it's a very long story. There are two books about it. But they wound up, they were having, Barney was having health problems, ulcers and so forth. I mean, a mixed marriage in New Hampshire in 1961 was a little unusual to begin with. And I should add, Betty was a social worker, a supervisor in the welfare department, in the state of New Hampshire. Barney worked for the post office, but was on the governor's civil rights commission. They were invited, incidentally, to the inauguration of Lyndon Johnson because of their work for, in politics. Well respected in the community. Well, after a couple of years, because of the ulcers and so forth, which weren't responding to normal treatment, they wound up in the office of Dr. Benjamin Simon, a psychiatrist. And he didn't know anything about flying saucers, but he knew one heck of a lot about helping people relive distressing traumatic experience. They didn't call it post-traumatic stress disorder back then, shell shock war veterans. He ran a hospital that had 3,000 beds after World War II with shell shock war veterans. The Army made a movie starring Dr. Benjamin Simon showing how he used medical hypnosis to help people relive their experiences, induced amnesia after each session. I mean, some of those guys, you know, your buddy's head gets blown off next to you. That's a little hard to handle. But most of those people got well. Here he hypnotized them each separately, induced amnesia after each session so they couldn't talk to each other about it, taped it all, eventually played back the tapes for them, and they were astonished to see that they had both relived the same incredible experience of that craft having landed, of them being taken on board against their will, being treated as specimens. Stick a needle here, scrape a little skin there, cut a little hair here, separate rooms, put back out till they wouldn't remember what happened and didn't remember until this elaborate, sophisticated, expensive procedure set of them was conducted. Now, Yes, I believe the story. My co-author on the book uh, is Betty's niece. Heard about the story the very next day when Betty called Kathy's mother. Saw the marks on the car and a lot of the other physical stuff. Uh, one of the exciting things about the story, strange thing if you will, is Betty under hypnosis is reliving how she's trying to get the leader of the group to tell her where he's from. I know you're not from around here, the understatement of the week. So he shows her what turns out to be a 3D, probably a holographic map, a bunch of points of light, supposedly stars, connected with different kinds of lines, trade routes, occasional expeditions, that sort of thing. She's looking up at this thing about three feet by two feet by two feet, well, where are you on the map? The wise guy alien says, do you know where you are? I don't know anything about astronomy. Well, how can I tell you where I'm from if you don't know where you're at? End of discussion. <laughs> now, poor Dr. Simon. He's got two obviously intelligent, sensitive people, but they're talking star maps and trade routes and occasional expeditions. Oh, boy. He asks her if she can remember what the map looks like. She says yes. Turns out Betty has a very good 3D sense. He gives her a post-hypnotic suggestion. If and only if you can remember it accurately, please draw it later on. And she did. It's in the book, The Interrupted Journey, the first book. And there were base stars and occasional expeditions out here. But what the heck does this mean? I mean, a galaxy's got a couple hundred billion stars in it. Obviously, they're not all there. Where are we? Doesn't mean anything. Well. 
A brilliant woman named Marjorie Fish did something nobody else had ever done. She built a total of 25 different, 26 different three-dimensional models of our local galactic neighborhood, trying to see if she could find a 3D pattern to match this 2D pattern. And after an enormous amount of work and getting new data on the distances, that's the hard part here. There's Marjorie. She was also a sculptress. Believe it or not, that's me, a few years back. This is one of her models. Biggest one had 250 stars in it. The hard part is getting accurate distance data. We got good angle data, but the astronomers didn't care how far things are because we're not going any place. What difference does it make? Well, if you're building a model, you better get the right distance data. She found eventually one and only one pattern that matched line length for line length, angle for angle, what Betty had drawn. Uh, several special features here now. All the pattern stars, the ones connected with lines, are the right kind for planets and life. That's only true of about 5% of the stars in the neighborhood. There's that word again, neighborhood. I'm talking about within 55 light years, there's about 2,000 stars. Don't tell me about other galaxies and so forth. On top of that, not only are all the pattern stars the right kind for planets and life, but in that very well-defined three-dimensional volume of space, all the sun-like stars are part of the pattern, and all the pattern stars are sun-like. The chance of that being a coincidence, about one in 10,000. Some say one in a million, but as you know, I'm a very conservative person, so only one in 10,000. Very exciting piece of work. I was the first to publish about it. Uh, and then I convinced Astronomy Magazine to publish an article about it. Got more response than anything they'd ever published before or since. Some of it nasty, noisy, negativist, I'll tell you that. One of the amazing things was that everybody who attacked her work misrepresented what she had done, which seems very strange. That includes my University of Chicago classmate for three years, Carl Sagan. Really remarkable. Don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up. And he did it on the Cosmos program too, which has been seen by literally hundreds of millions of people. This is an old one, we have better distance data now, but you see where it says sun up in the middle on the right hand side? Maybe I should use the pointer, what the heck. I think that says sun, doesn't it? Yes. Hard to read from here, but. If I do it on here, does it show? No, that would be neat, wouldn't it? Uh, those distances, 19 LY, those are light years. It, they're a little off. We have much better data now. So Zeta-1 and Zeta-2 are reticuli, the base stars. Anything special about them? You never heard of them, I'm sure. Well, as it happens, there is. They're the closest to each other pair of sun-like stars in our entire local neighborhood. The 39, the actual number now, is 39.3 light years away from us, just down the street. But from each other, they're only an eighth of a light year apart. Now, we're out in the boondocks, next to our 4.3 light years. These guys are 35 times closer to each other than we are to the next star over. They got next to our neighbors. Oh, not only can you see planets around the other star from each star, and the other stars visible all day long. But those two stars just happen to be a cool billion years older than the sun. Billion. That has a couple of implications. One, you'd expect there'd be an earlier push for interstellar between the stars travel when you've got a next door neighbor than when you're out in the boonies like us. Secondly, you've got a billion years to develop a little better technology than we have. Look what we've done in the last hundred years. What would a civilization be like if it was a thousand years ahead of us, or a million, or a cool billion? Anybody here think they know what the technology would be like? I know I don't. Very exciting piece of work. Gives a target. This was published by Astronomy Magazine at my... They published an initial article by Terrence Dickinson, who was the editor at the time, and then they got 11 letters that, that they republished after that got more response than any article they'd ever published before or since. 
They put out this 32-page full-color booklet, sold 10,000 copies very quickly, which is unheard of. And then Carl Sagan's lawyer, you'll see his name is down the bottom there, threatened to sue them because his name was there, and it was there only because it was, he's the author of a couple of pieces in here. And they made me an offer I couldn't refuse, and I wound up with 18,000 copies in my garage in California. I am totally out. I'm sorry, I cannot sell you a copy of the booklet. 32 pages long, it's beautiful, covers both sides, makes a strong case for the reality of this instance. This. Here's what the aliens look like. That was Marjorie's done uh, doing. Betty had, I call him Ichabod, she had another name for him. But your typical little gray guy, what can I say? There's the book. Use the order blank or go to Amazon.com or go to my website, www.stantonfriedman.com. And I mention it only because you can buy the book in a lot of places, but you won't get a signature. So you get it from me, you get a signature. Uh, that came out in 2007. And Kathleen Martin, whose name is down the bottom, is Betty's niece. This is an inside story. I play the heavy, I deal with the attacks and the star map and stuff like that. Now, of course, you know, Friedman's going to talk about Roswell, because I'm the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. And of course, you normally see just the Roswell Daily Record, not exactly one of the great newspapers of the time. This is July 8, 1947, wide coverage in evening papers from Chicago West. I don't mean the All-Star game. And it's, it's just a little article, uh, three short paragraphs. Dick's Army finds air saucer on ranch in New Mexico. Oh, the Chicago Daily News, not a trivial paper. Uh, the press release about this went out around noon New Mexico time, too late for all the East Coast papers, just in time for the evening papers from Chicago West. There's the Roswell paper, and RAAF does not stand for Royal Australian Air Force, as somebody tried to insist to me. Sorry, it's Roswell Army Airfield, which later name became Walker Field and so forth. Uh, there's what it looks like in New Mexico. Roswell in the lower right-hand corner. That yellow area is White Sands Missile Range. Uh, the place where the first atomic bomb was let off is there, Albuquerque. And there were two crashes, uh, one over there, one over here. Uh, it's a very long story. There's a lot of books out, some of them full of baloney again. Uh, when I say I'm the original civilian investigator, I was not there in 1947. I may be old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> I was the first to hear this story from Major Jesse Marcel. It was referred to him by a television station manager in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was supposed to do three interviews, I'd done two. The third reporter hadn't shown up yet, no cell phones, and he's looking at his watch, he's giving me coffee, and out of the blue he says, you know, the guy you ought to talk to is Jesse Marcel. And brilliant investigator that I am, I said, who's he? Oh, he handled wreckage of one of those saucers you were interested in when he was in the Air Force. What? <laughs> you know, totally out of the blue. What do you know about him? Lives over in Homa. I've been there, but I didn't know where it was then. Louisiana, pretty good sized city. Uh, he's a great guy, we're old ham radio buddies, you ought to talk to him. Okay, the reporter shows up, had a great response that night. I figure, what the heck, let's, let's keep at it. So I called information in Homa, got a number for Jesse, talked to him, he told me his story. He couldn't deny it, it turns out he'd been, his name's been in the newspapers and so forth. He was the intelligence officer at Roswell Army Airfield. And a rancher had come into the sheriff's office. Sheriff called the base. He had this strange wreckage. And Jesse took a look at it, talked to his boss, Colonel Blanchard, who told him to take a counterintelligence corps guy out with you. Follow the rancher. You couldn't tell anybody where this place was. It was out in the middle of nowhere. And they didn't have GPS back then, as you may recall. Uh, and so they followed the rancher out. They stayed overnight in their sleeping bags. He gave them a can of beans. 
And the next day, they went out and saw the debris field. Three quarters of a mile long, a few hundred yards wide, strewn with crazy materials. But two important things. Nothing conventional. When a plane crashes, you expect to find vacuum tubes, propellers, rivets, uh, tags that say made in Oshkosh, whatever. There was nothing conventional out there. And there was no crater. When airplanes crash, normally they dig a big hole in the ground. So Jesse figured this thing had to have exploded above the ground in order for this stuff to be spread out over such a large area. Large area. What was this stuff? Very lightweight, extraordinarily strong metallic material, some plastic Bakelite-like materials. They didn't have many plastics back then. And the foil-like material that was all over the place that you could fold and fold and fold again and it would unfold on its own. Memory metal, which we have now but didn't have then, that you couldn't tear it. Brought the stuff back, showed it to his son late that night. They went out on the 6th of July, a Sunday. The 7th they explored out there, brought stuff back, only a car full, there was plenty of it left, showed it to his son that night at home. The next day goes into the base on July 8th, the day of those newspaper articles, and uh, the base commander tells the base public information officer, put out a press release saying we've recovered one of these flying disc people have been seeing. The big noise started on June 24th. It's July 8th, so we're only talking two weeks later. There are already a thousand sightings in that interim period of time. Made headlines all over the place. And Jesse is instructed to take some of this wreckage to Wright Patterson Air Force Base. It's gone through several names, I'll use that one. Why? Because that's a standard place for bringing enemy equipment. Wreckage from German fighter planes, uh, a MiG when a pilot defected, bring it to right field, take it apart, see what makes it tick. Stop at our headquarters, 8th Air Force. This was the 509th in Roswell. They were kind of elite. They had dropped the only group to ever drop an atomic bomb at that time. They dropped the two on Japan. They dropped two more in the Pacific in 1946. Handpicked officers, handpicked men, headquarters, 8th Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas. So they stopped in Fort Worth. General Roger Amy, head of the 8th Air Force, tells Jesse, you don't say anything. I'll take care of it. They had phony wreckage brought in, real weather balloon, radar reflector stuff. They told the press that's all there was. Terrible mistake. Sorry about that. He lied, in other words, intentionally. Uh, and the Los Angeles paper has Army captures flying saucer, second line, full width. General thinks it's radar weather gadget. By the next day, that was the end of the story. Remy empties Roswell's saucer. Now, that was the first of, well, the first two of four explanations. If the first one doesn't work, try a second one. If that doesn't work, try a third one. The third one, First we got, we captured a flying saucer. Oops, sorry, just a radar reflector weather balloon combination. And then many years later, oh, you know what? It was a mogul balloon trail. They were very classified. 15 to 20 balloons at 20 foot intervals carrying uh, devices. They want to make a constant altitude balloon uh, to listen for Soviet nuclear tests thousands of miles away. Very highly classified. The rancher was brought back into town, told to tell another story about the first article said it was found last week. Oh, you know, it was really found on June 14th. And it really was pieces of rubber and strips of balsa wood and stuff like that. And of course, the Air Force report wouldn't quote the bottom of the article, which said the rancher said, uh, one thing I'm certain of is it wasn't a balloon. Why was he certain? Because he had recovered balloons before. These were standard neoprene balloons. They were so classified that many of the launches were left to just come to ground. No chase plane, no people recovering this highly classified wreckage. In other words, it was balderdash squared. 
baloney on top of baloney. Uh, there's Major Marcel in General Ramey's office with this phony baloney stuff. There's General Ramey on the left, Colonel Thomas Jefferson DuBose on the right. General Ramey is holding a piece of paper in his hand. Now, if you listen to the Air Force, we showed this film to uh, an agency, and they couldn't make out anything on the paper. Oh, dear, more lies. Uh, you're telling me there's nothing written on that? That's a slide made from a scan of the original negative. And Dr. David Rudiak has figured out that among the things it says are victims of the wreck. Since when do weather balloons have victims? You know, uh, it's a long involved story. There's Tommy DuBose. I found him, met with him, standing two feet away from me. He tells me he took the call from General Ramey's boss, telling him, giving him three orders. Send some of that wreckage up here today with one of your Colonel Couriers. Get the press off our back. I don't care how you do it. And I don't want you ever to talk about it again, not even with your buddy Roger Ramey. That's an order, Colonel. Do I need to put it in writing? No, sir. These were both West Pointers when it took.